Aloha. Welcome to Waikiki Beach. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. My wife always says, start off your show with the sign of the cross in Hawaiian. So, Ake Inoa, Ke Makua, Ke Keiki, Ame Ke Ohana Hemalele. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Dudes, we have got a great show today. I, I really like this guy. I wish I, I wish I, I could just tell I'd love to uh, sit on the back porch and, of his family home there in Tennessee, 200-year-old residence there in, in, in Tennessee. Have a cigar and a shot of good Tennessee whiskey and talk stories. So let's just kind of pretend we're doing that. We got Rod Bennett with us, and we're going to talk about Scripture Wars. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. My co-host today, my co-adventure guide is Rod Bennett. You know, why do we call it the Bear Wozniak Adventure? Because every one of us is on an adventure. We've all got a great a great journey to take. If we just abandon ourselves to God's will, get ready for a wild ride. Uh, we have as our guest today, Rod Bennett. Uh, he, he, we have a lot of a lot in common, I guess, a lot in background. But I want to ask you. Let's start first of all. You're in Tennessee. Are you really living on a 200 year old family home there? Yeah, more than 200. We've def we've got uh, definite proof that our uh, family came here in 1819, and uh, that's been uh, more than 200 years ago now. And we probably had been there a little while before that. So. Uh, uh, are there in any, the same family, same family's owned the property the whole time. So. Are there any log uh, log uh, barns or cabins on, on that property? Well, the log houses are gone now. The house I'm in now was built in 1914. I tell people I sleep every night in the bedroom where my mother was born and her father was born. And uh, uh, but we're not quite the log house. This is even though this house is 100 and something years old. This is the third house to sit on this property and well, those you, previous two were log houses well i'm going to ask you a name do you know of a person named johnny jet uh that sounds familiar but do you, i don't know do you know who I the barn up right away do you know who the barnyard builders are mm, that sounds familiar. okay they're up there in the hills in that area and my wife uh i'll come in from a from surfing or whatever i walk in she's taking a time short time out she watches barn Barn wall builders, I think is what it's called. <laughs> and they're there in that area, and we're addicted to these guys because it turns out they're all Christians, but they, they're they tearing down, or they're not tearing down, they're saving, uh, up th mostly up there in the, in the Appalachian area and the mountains of Tennessee and all the way down to Georgia, and then sometimes they'll go into Texas now. But they, they take old barns, mostly barns and some cabins, that are, gonna, that are not going to make right. it. They're going to fall apart. And they take right. the best of those old logs and, That's and right. the walls yeah. and they take them apart and then they rebuild them someplace else and and the, the amount of expertise of those pioneers you know building the, do you think those log cabins that were there on that property at one time were built off of logs that were on the property oh, that were oh, taken almost certainly almost certainly we we have good paperwork for uh out the history of our family here in fact we know the name of the old cherokee man whose property this was before the Cherokees sold and moved to North Carolina. So we we even know the prehistory of uh, of this property. So uh, well, you know, I've been almost through, certain, yes, that I've all never, the timber was harvested right here. That's the way they did it, and they cut it down, and they used aids or whatever that was. Things are called had to shave them and fit them, and they didn't have they didn't use iron nails they use wooden nails and, and interlocking joints and and so my wife and i watched this series with johnny jet and i forget the, the the other guy but they all one of the one of the what was what this guy say one of the they asked him what is the question what was the the greatest the the, the coolest house i think uh, uh johnny jet said it's it's the house uh, of my soul that god resides in you know, know about so that. just real now you're not Good anyone answer. you're not one of those southern baptists so you didn't come you're you're i know you're catholic now but were you southern baptist i was yeah i uh, uh i think that was the tradition in my family and uh i was raised a southern baptist and and stuck to that until my mid-20s i, lo I love I those guys i love those wandering guys. around 
Yeah, you were. Yeah, I love those guys. You know, I was raised Catholic, but I moved from Santa Cruz, California to Waco, Texas, which every Southern Baptist knows is the home of the Notre Dame of Southern Baptists, right? Baylor. Exactly. Exactly. The and great I, beating heart. Yeah, and I loved those. Uh, and I went to, uh, I had to take religion classes, so I took Bible courses while I was there. And the professors, to me, at Indianapolis, Indiana Jones hadn't come out yet, but one of the professors just reminded me of that guy because he knew languages and archaeology, and he just he knew it made the Bible come to life for me. And my, my Southern Baptist friends prayed for me, and I was good friends with a lot of the really beautiful Christians, still am. And, uh, and, so I, but I, and I did have a beautiful spiritual conversion, I would say, while I was at Baylor through the, through the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, which, right. as you know, involves praying in tongues and things like that. So they right. went away for the summer, and I came back, and then they came back. And, uh, yeah, praise God, Jesus, you know, I love Jesus. And they go, yeah, but now we got to pray because you went too far. He went just a little bit too far. <laughs> Oops. But I'm dedicating this show to my friend Bubba Hicks, who I played high school football with the year I moved to Texas, my senior year in high school, which high, Texas football is gnarly. He went on to become the great field goal kicker at Baylor and still holds the record there. And he's a beautiful Southern Baptist married to his beautiful Catholic bride. So we're going to dedicate this to Bubba. So tell us about Absolutely. that. Tell us then about your journey as uh, Southern Baptist. And I think you went into non non-denominational land for a little bit. Let's hear about you. And then I want to dig into your book, Scripture Wars, talking about Justin okay. Martyr and his battle for, uh, you know, for the time when they were discerning on the what would be in the Bible. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I, I will. Uh, I wish I had a dramatic story of conversion that I got knocked off my mule by a bolt of lightning and... Uh, and had a, <laughs> a dramatic conversion like that. But mine was pretty bookish, I think. Uh, I love those kind I, of conversions. I love that. When I went away as a young man, joined the Navy uh, in the late 70s, uh, you know, like a lot of young men out on their own for the first time, I sowed my wild oats. And uh, my mother sent me, worried about me, sent me because uh, she knew I liked science fiction books and fantasy and that sort mm. of thing. He thought she'd make a connection with me by sending me books of C.S. Lewis. Oh, the the, so the trilogy, got, the space trilogy. Right, and also yeah. the, the Narnia books. And, yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, I ate that up and got fascinated with the guy and read the uh, screw tape letters and then Mere Christianity and the rest of it. So that was, uh, that was a great reconversion to Christianity for me in a lot of ways. But it also, like a lot, as it has been for a lot of people, it was an introduction to a more historical version of Christianity. More of an orthodox. He was he was orthodox in his belief. He wasn't Catholic, but yeah, C.S. Lewis, dude. When I first when I had that moment when I came back uh, after summer and everyone's like freaking out because I I went in head first with my deep conversion in the Lord. Hey man, C.S. Lewis space trilogy. I, I read I read that within the first few months of that, and I and I just deep into C.S. Lewis. What yeah, a mind. me too. I, I very quickly bought everything of his that I could find. But then didn't you eventually get into G.K. too, didn't you? Well, you wrote yes, something about him. Ch Ch uh, Lewis, whose word was gospel for me at that time, yeah. said at some point that the book that had influenced him the most in his Christian journey was Chesterton's Everlasting Man. Uh. So I immediately sought that out as fast as I could, but was horrified when I got it. <laughs> to learn that he was a Roman Catholic. Wait, wait, wait a minute. What? Wait, what? Cause, how cause... on earth, right, how on earth could Lewis have, uh, who who everybody in my circle says is okay, how could he have recommended uh, this uh, horrible well, Romanist? Well, it's, sa it's sad because the Southern Baptists, uh, you know, really a tremendous prejudice against Catholics, but really all based on, on false understanding of what Catholicism is. But yeah, so that's quite a leap for a Southern Baptist to be reading GK. Well, it was. In fact, I was, uh, I had, uh, I was pretty scared by the whole thing. I remember <laughs> buying the book, and then I kind of got afraid of it and took it and put it in the bottom of a drawer somewhere and hid it for a while. Uh, uh, you know, if I'd been really wholehearted <laughs> about it, I'd have thrown it away, of course. You know, but, uh, uh, but yeah. no, there was something going on. But, yeah. Uh, but no, I uh, I hid it for a while, but then I went back in, and uh, I you know I guess I'd taken the fatal bite of the apple at that point because uh, everything I found in Lewis, I found even better in Chester. Yeah, it was like it was it, it was off to the races after if that. If you're gonna if you're gonna you're a young man or a young woman, and you're you're bookish at all, you're gonna find C.S. Lewis, 
and you're going to go to G.K. Chesterton. And I just suggest you read everything by both of those dudes. I mean, you don't have to get into the distributionist type stuff like I know you have done with G.K. and things like that. But but their books are just so so uh, G.K. has such a sense of humor, doesn't he? He puts yes. everything yeah. upside down. Well, you, you think it's this, but it's actually that. Yeah, it's uh, he's his famous paradoxes. Uh, yeah. Which is so he was famous for that in his own lifetime. Yeah, we love GK, and he did. Didn't he? Didn't he uh, do a great debate? I think at Carnegie Hall with the guy who was in the what was the the, the attorney's name? Clarence Darrow. Was Clarence that? Darrow. Yeah, yes, he he, he humbled him. Darrow, who was the uh, secularist champion at the Scopes monkey trial, as they called it, which took place only a few miles from here. No way. Well, he Tennessee. Yeah. He humbled that guy, but he humbled him with a with a, a smile on his face. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Chesterton could, could never. He had, he didn't have a mean bone in his body, so he couldn't. He never wanted to humiliate or uh, or uh, degrade anybody. And so, uh, and in fact, I think the thing ended pretty amiably. Yeah. Uh, uh, but the two uh, uh, the two of them are pretty interesting characters. Uh, uh, Darrow, you know, the the Scopes trial in Dayton was uh, never a real trial. People don't don't realize that that was a that whole thing was a publicity stunt. I mean, it wasn't right. a real and trial. And it was all based on. Well, you know, we got to take a break. I'm sorry. We're gonna, we're, <laughs> I, I, we go. You and I, I think we could have that that whiskey and cigar and go off on a long tangent. Yeah, absolutely. One of these. Absolutely. But we're talking with Rod Bennett. The, the book I'm interested in talking story with him about is Scripture Wars. I love Justin Martyr. We're going to talk about how Justin Martyr rescued the Old Testament for Christians. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. Now you can journey with other men on the adventure of a lifetime, growing in manly virtue through Bear's Man Cave community in our three-year school of manliness. Join at deepadventure.com. Better yet, you can lead your own sons through the same compelling video, audio, and written content. Can you imagine how much deeper your relationship with your dad could have been and how much more you could have learned and pitfalls you might have avoided if your dad had a tool like this to help to draw you both into a deeper, life-changing discussion? Now you have a trigger that you can pull that will take you into gritty discussions with other men and with your sons at deepadventure.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. You can gain traction in the virtues in my book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. And you can be inspired by my personal testimony of heartache and triumph with my book, A Surfing Guide to the Soul, both newly published by Sophia and available at our web store, deepadventure.com and also on Amazon.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned now. Here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Hey, I want to invite everybody there. I wrote a book. My wife inspired it. We were driving along the road here by Diamond Head in Waikiki. And she said, you're going to love this song. And it was Paula Cole. And she was lamenting uh, the loss of real men. And, she, and the, one of the words of the phrases of the song is, where is my John Wayne? Where have all the cowboys gone? So my book, 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? Uh, it, it, it talks story about, you know, uh, you know, the, 
ba- basically it's like a father speaking to a son or brothers talking to each other, challenging each other, man. You, you know, the word man, by the way, the re- Latin word for that ma- word is ver. It's where you get the word virtue. We're not talking about the genius of masculinity. We're talking about just plain old manliness. And I based my whole book on one person. His name is Rod Bennett, the manliest guy in all of Tennessee. <laughs> no, we got Rod Bennett back. We got Rod Bennett in the house. And um, uh, to, to just tell us a little bit more about your your conversion, and then we got to get into your book. So talk. To, so you, <laughs> Southern Baptist on his way to becoming a Catholic. That's a wild ride. Uh-huh. Well, I, I, uh, uh, I'll just say to finish up with what we spoke about earlier, that uh, it was a pretty short walk from Chesterton to J.R.R. Tolkien and then to uh, Cardinal Newman. Oh. And Cardinal Newman introduced me to the early church fathers. And that you see really all those sealed books behind me. You know what those yeah. are, right? Yeah. That really sealed the deal. Uh, finding out, to, just to give you the shortest possible version, finding out that all of the Catholic distinctives, all of those things that I had chalked up to being barnacles that had gotten attached to the ship through the centuries, medieval inventions like uh, devotion to Mary and and the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist and other things like that, all those things that I had always thought were later accretions, things that had attached themselves to Christianity that didn't really belong there. When I opened up books of writings from early Christians who, they, who some of them knew the apostles. Some of right. them had been baptized by the apostles. And to find these things in writings that were, you know, 50, 100 years, 200 years after Christ, all of those things right there in your face was a watershed. You yeah, know? you know, me too. That's what brought me back to the church. Um, they weren't barnacles on the boat. They were the boat. And the early church fathers are all so consistent with each other uh, for the most part. And, and, and uh, um, so consistent with scripture, you know. Uh, but yeah, they weren't. They weren't. That, that's what brought me back. And so you you found the early church fathers. Which ones really first spoke to you? Oh well, uh, you, Justin is one of them, and that's why there's a whole book there. But also, of course, uh, Ignatius of Antioch. I mean, mm-hmm. the earliest, really, the earliest uh, writings that exist outside the pages of the New Testament, Christian writings, other than a few fragments and uh, scraps. And uh, it's all there in Ignatius. All of the, uh, you know, he calls the Eucharist the medicine of immortality. Right. He, uh, uh, he talked, I mean, the whole scheme is there. But who and, came up Who came uh, up with the word Catholic? Who was that? Well, we don't know that. Uh, we but we know, we know an we early know writer. We history of it. We do know that it's present in letters of Ignatius and that were written about 109 A.D., maybe 104 yeah, and uh, uh, so that's within ten years of the death of the last apostle. So, and he speaks about it as if uh, it's already a recognized term, a coined phrase. Right. He uses the phrase, but he doesn't claim to be the inventor of it, and he's certainly not coining it there in his letter. He speaks about it as if everybody knows what it means. So then, what happened? So you find the early church fathers. When did you go? Oh no, I got to become Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a bit of a that was a bit of a long story. I wrestled with it for a while. Mm-hmm. I, uh, it's in fact, it probably took me about 10 years to, uh, to, uh, work through all of it from the time that I started discovering the ancient faith to the time that I, uh, actually was received into the Catholic church was about 10 years. In fact, my wife was ready to go before I was, uh, she told, <laughs> she told her mother, uh, uh, five years before I was ready that we were all, we were both going to become Catholic. Mm-hmm. So that, that was a bit, a bit of a. A bit but I, a, I, I, you know, the guy, but the guys that you loved, like C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, and and there were others there in the in the Inklings that that's that that generation after Chesterton, they had one motto, and that was that they would follow truth wherever it led, and that's what you did. Well, you you try, you really do try. It's uh, uh, it's awfully hard to uh, not be bossed around by your feelings, by your emotions. Some of the wisest words that were ever said, nobody knows who said them. The old proverb that the man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Uh, <laughs> Nothing yeah. on earth is more true than that. Right. And I was very much being convinced against my will. Uh, I was not anxious to do this. It wasn't some, some sort of stunt. Unlike some people, very sincere people, 
that were converted by the beauty of the liturgy or the love of Gregorian chant or all I'm, of that. I'm, I'm Ukrainian. Great. I'm Ukrainian. Vladimir, Emperor Vladimir, was converted through beauty and the love of bacon. I must say, because Muslims and Jews <laughs> don't eat bacon. But <laughs> but, but I, I'm like Ukrainian, you, man. I beauty had, and beauty and bacon. Look at me, beauty yeah. and bacon. <laughs> but like you, I had had wonderful experiences with other type of wor other types of worship, mm. uh, charismatic or. Uh, uh, or Jesus movement type yes, worship, yes. all of the happy clappy stuff that some people make so, make so much fun out of. But it's beautiful. Uh, Those people love yeah. Jesus, man. It's Col have, cultural. Yeah. Uh, we oughtn't to elevate cultural preferences to absolutes. And uh, so I absolutely second the emotion of people who say I was converted by the beauty of Gregorian chant. Peter, but other Peter people Cray have different Pe different uh, different paths. No, Peter Kraft was converted converted by beauty you know they hear this right. one of the deepest philosophical thinkers of our time was converted by beauty when he went into a cathedral i believe in new york with his dad right so uh, uh but i guess i i guess i have to say that that mine was a bit uh, headier than that and uh, uh it just had a different path to walk than than some folks but, but eventually okay so now let's, let's let's just take this leap so justin martyr uh this book scripture wars is based on so you find the early church fathers and this is, was my journey. I read Stephen Ray's book, Crossing the Tiber. You know, I had right. this beautiful conversion in college. I was a Catholic, but I gradually went into non-denominational land. But my dad and mom continued in the faith. My dad became a Catholic deacon. He sent me Stephen Ray's book, who's now a good friend of mine. Yeah. But I found the church, because his book is written to his dad. It's very endearing, but very intellectual. And it's all based on scripture and a lot of footnotes with the early church fathers. And when I found the early church fathers, I felt like I was the, the guy who discovered that the emperor wasn't wearing any clothes. It was like, oh my God. Oh. And I read, the, I read the writings of this man, Justin Martyr. And when he describes, the, I believe it's called the Epiclesis, I thought I learned those words as an altar boy. And I realized the primitive church was a Catholic church. And I had no right. choice. The but to come the, back. Uh, you know, when I said that all of the Catholic distinctives were not inventions of the Middle Ages, but are found in these early fathers, that's not an opinion. That's simply a matter of fact. And now, you can read, read the books. They're right there. We've, we, now, that doesn't mean that the job is finished there. In other words, all it, all it does is disprove the idea that these things are later inventions. They might still be wrong. They might still have been there from very, very early and still be wrong. Obviously, I don't, I don't think that. But uh, I'm not trying to bully anybody into uh, saying the early fathers have got you in a chokehold and they, they're well, you know, in your head and you have to holler uncle, you know. But yeah, I, I remember those that, days. I've had that happen to me. <laughs> but, but, but I am saying that you've had at least one block knocked out from under you, and that is the idea that all this stuff was invented centuries later. And you got and you got to rely on that anymore. You yeah, you got to come wrestle up with something it. different. You got to wrestle with it. Yeah. Uh, well, so now now let's talk more about the this book itself. You know, um, the you think about Paul versus the Marcionites. We're going to talk a little bit about that, uh, but. The the uh, the concept that 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 when I, I you know I didn't know I thought the Bible fell out of the sky and I think a lot of Southern Baptists think that it came down as King James Bible you know and and I didn't know where the Bible came from I just had a feeling that Jesus was there this miraculous thing happened and there was a Bible and then fifteen hundred years go by and then we begin to learn about more stuff around the time of Martin Luther, you know, I, I just didn't know uh, the, the source for the scriptures. And so when, when we get back, when we'll talk story about how the Bible came to be and, and the battle, the battles that were waged in discerning which books would be kept in and which books weren't. We're talking with Rod, Rod Bennett and his book called Scripture, War, scripture Wars uh, and talking about one of my favorite saints, Justin Martyr. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. This is Daniel DeVoon Markham with another episode of Country Up, Ignorance. Some folks say ignorance is bliss. Well, now, pull on the reins there, partner. That is just plain stupid as a board. That just means one wants to avoid responsibility. 
Follow me on this. If one is ignorant, especially about things of value, that means he or she is working on stupid. In fact, stupid is likely to put your life in reverse permanently. And while ignorance makes stupid, knowledge can be dangerous because knowledge on its own makes no one wise. Great knowledge may make you an expert at something, but without wisdom, you could likely end up causing boo harm. Think about the folks who designed the atomic bomb. Mega knowledge, but devastating destruction and ensuing fear for generations. Today's information age culture exalts knowledge above wisdom. Without wisdom, knowledge is just stuff. Standing alone by itself, it's neither good nor bad. Wisdom assures knowledge will result in wholesomeness and goodness. And wisdom is primarily not just telt, it's also schvelt. You get it by reading the works of the wise and hanging around people of wisdom. Like my old friend Arthur Dye. Arthur listened carefully to everyone, spoke thoughtfully and sparingly with discretion. I've soaked in considerable wisdom from men and women of God, like Martin Lloyd-Jones, who wrote the masterpiece Sermon on the Mount. Reading that book transitioned me from being a Bible know-it-all hotshot preacher onto a path towards humility with a wider view of the kingdom of God and life. Proverbs 24 reads, Know also that wisdom is sweet to your soul. If you find it, there is future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. This is Daniel the Boone Markham at countryup.org on a journey a few miles this side of heaven. We invite our mama bears to join with us at deepadventure.com. You'll have access to all of the Long Ride Home TV shows even before they air on EWTN. Plus, three years of the shareable Ocean Sunrise daily catechism videos. Plus, at deepadventure.com, a 20% discount at our online store with all of our great t-shirts and clothes and books and rosaries and medals and all kinds of accessories. You'll also get an autographed copy of Bear's latest book, and for a limited time, a Catholic biker stuffed teddy bear. All at deepadventure.com. Come on, Mama Bears, let's hear you roar. Did you know that each Saturday morning you can receive the shareable YouTube video version of the Bear Wozniak Adventure in our inspiring weekly newsletter, even before it airs on the radio or hits the podcast apps? Never miss another episode. You can even binge watch Bear's inspiring guests. Think about the impact you can have sharing these videos with your friends. Go to deepadventure.com and click the subscribe button. Be the kind of man that when he gets out of bed in the morning, the devil says, oh no, he's up. Go to deepadventure.com and invite Bear to speak. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wasik Adventure. We invite you to go to our website, deepadventure.com. Mama Bears, you can join our Mama Bears there. And men, you can join the Man Cave in the School of Manliness. Uh, when you join the School of Manliness in the Man Cave, you become part of a non-Facebook community where the men share with each other, challenge each other, encourage each other. I think of it like the Cave of Adullam, like when King David, all the men gathered with him there at the cave, the misfits, the, the guys running from the law, running who owed people money, and they gathered together, and God made these knuckle-draggers uh, into the mighty men of valor. They formed each other as well. So come and join the man cave and, and, and go through the School of Manliness with us and lead your sons through the School of Manliness too. That's all at deepadventure.com. We're talking with Rod Bennett. <laughs> so, good cop, bad cop. Which is it? Is it the Old Testament God or the New Testament God? Talk to us about that. Yeah, that was uh, uh, the apparent discontinuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament is something that everybody has to deal with in one way or the other. Uh, one common version of it you always hear and used to hear a lot, a lot. I don't know if they still preach it that much, but at least in, in the 70s, you used to hear about the God, the Old Testament God of wrath and judgment. And then Jesus came and showed us uh, the New Testament God of love and compassion and forgiveness. You can't have done very much reading in the Old Testament to have not seen an awful lot of compassion and long-suffering and forgiveness on God's part. 
it is one long story of forgiving people that you and I wouldn't even forgive nowadays. Some of these people were barbarians, you know. <laughs> read the, the book. Uh, of, read uh, the book of Psalms. I mean, my exactly. God. Some of the some of the Old Testament heroes are, you know. Uh, I've got a chapter of a book I'm writing now called David the Barbarian. And I want to read. You, oh, tell me when it's out. We'll get you on. You think about how wonderful we think of David with his harp and, uh, <laughs> and David the shepherd boy and all the rest of it. He was a man of war. His hands were so bloody from war that uh, God wouldn't allow him to build a temple to him. He said, it'll be your son Solomon that builds it because he'll, he'll be a man of peace. So uh, you, you see all of this in the Old Testament. There is, you're dealing with people that are living in the Bronze Age. I mean, they're, mm. they're very rough and very bad examples of Christian saints. Uh, you know, David had a hundred concubines or more. I don't know how many it was. His Solomon was even worse. Uh, you know, all of it makes no sense from a Christian point of view. And there is an apparent discontinuity between the Old Testament's idea of a saint and the New Testament's idea of a Christian hero. So, uh, and there's all sorts of other things like that. You only have to read the book of Deuteronomy or the laws that are in the book of Leviticus and all the rest of it to not think that a lot of it is pretty strange, uh, pretty, you know, picky and little uh, uh, laws about cleanliness and how to handle a dead body and other things like that. And, and you know, Deuteronomy chapter 25 is this blast of all the horrors that God is going to put on uh, Israel if they don't, if they go back on their promise to obey and keep the law. So uh, there is an appearance of discontinuity. Yeah, and, and it started with one simple law, thou shall not eat. Right. And then it, and it ends with, my wife says, but it ends with another command, thou shall eat the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, you so you go. cannot have life within you. So, so, so this go. appearance of discontinuity mm -hmm. is what uh, has caused a lot of trouble and heresy through the centuries. And a lot of it depends on uh, getting the right answer about what happened when Christ came, about what he intended to do, in what sense he fulfilled the law rather than abolishing it, all these things. And you, it does require uh, some legwork, some but brain I, work I, I to work through you, it all. I love the Old Testament. Oh, yeah. Because I'm, I love story. Yeah. And the thing about the Old Testament, and I, lo I just love the Old Testament, but the, the thing about the Old Testament is it's, the heroes are, are not like, I mean, they're very flawed. Murderers and everything among them, you know, that became they, the... But they were probably better. That's the odd thing is they were probably better than most of the surrounding people. But, the, but the, so this conflict <laughs> came to, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. And the one, the one thing unique about the Hebrews is they had one God. But let, yeah. let's, let's talk story about this good cop, bad cop, again, in light of this, the scripture wars, wars, the Paul versus the Marcionites. You dig into that. Tell us about that. What were, what were the well, Marcionites? Paul himself predates, uh, and his career was over by the time, time Marcion came along. Paul does talk but that's about... The, but the, that's the battle line, right? He does yeah. talk about their opposite number. Paul addresses the opposite end of the spectrum, the Judaizers. The Judaizers were people who said that the apostles had gone too far in allowing people to quit observing Moses' law. They, these, these were people who were Christian. But the law isn't the Ten Commandments. It's the law, all these rules, right, of right. what well, you well, eat to it's, eat, it's, how far you can... It's yes, both yes. things. It's both yes. uh, things. But, but he didn't throw out the Ten Commandments. N no, and that's, he, part of the, that's part of the discussion in, in the book, is how yes. we distinguish between what parts of the law are perpetual and what parts of the law were fulfilled. Oh, so, tell us about, yeah, tell us so, about that. Yeah. In fact, the very name Deuteronomy, the book Deuteronomy, that word means the second law. And Paul speaks of when he's addressing the Judaizers, he addresses the he talks about the law that was added. The In other words, law. the rest of the law that was added to the Ten Commandments. Oh. The uh, uh, so it's a. Uh, Probably too deep a concept to dig too far into. The book's a little it's bit. It's essential though because I, it's just something that's always when people read Paul, they think Paul is saying you don't have to be a moral person to get to heaven. In other words, it's by faith alone that you're saved. 
which is not even any in the Bible. The only place where faith alone is found is in James, where it said it is not by faith alone, but by works also. However, it's not Pelagianism. It's not by works alone. It's grace and works. But but the, but but that area confused me a lot. So right. it's so I don't have to follow the law. I kept thinking he was talking about the Ten Commandments. He was talking about all these other little rules, like you don't get to eat lobster. You well, know. be careful. Okay. Be careful. The the little rules weren't little. God promised to okay, bring I, I horrible apologize. devastation on the I people for breaking yeah. any of the laws. Right. You have to keep all of it. You the can't second drop laws. any of it. The second it, laws. Right, okay. All of it. The yeah. Ten Commandments and the second legislation. Got it. Okay. And uh, you, we've all heard casual sermons about... Uh, about how the Pharisees were were uh, uh, legalists who m majored on the minor and all the rest of it. The, the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, had done a very good job schooling the Pharisees and all the rest of, the, of Israel with the principle which is undoubtedly an authentic principle of the Old Testament, and that is that blessing comes to a people through obedience to the law, strict obedience to Moses' law, all of it, and cursing trouble, warfare, invasion comes when you neglect the law, even the really little ones, okay? Okay, so, very in good. the Old Testament. Thank you. Yeah, thank Right, you. so uh, the, uh, uh, we need to be careful saying that there were two different classes of laws, some of them important and some of them not important. That's not really the answer. How, what, what is the answer? The, the, the answer is that some of them were permanent and some of them were meant to pass away. Some of them had a built-in sell-by date that St. Paul connects to the coming of Messiah. And if Paul hadn't done that, Christianity, Christianity would have remained a small sect of Judaism. We would never would have probably made been it. reabsorbed back into ma right. mainline Judaism. His, under, his depth of uh, love. At, well, he was a he, what, what he was a Pharisee. Huh? So he so he his depth of understanding. They say, by the way, when he disappeared, he went away and just studied for three several years, maybe over a, the, the cave of, uh, uh, where I think where the, the mount, mountain where Moses uh, received the law. Mount Nebo. Yeah, they say, some say, some traditions say this. He went deep in the Old Testament and then drew out uh, his understanding. Right, right. So t tell, us, tell us about that. And then we got to take a break again. We'll talk about Justin Martyr. Well, Paul, in the book of Galatians, which is his, his treatise against uh, the Judaizers, the people who said Christians had to continue observing all of the Old Testament law. Uh, he says that the, the law that was added was destined to pass away with the coming of the one to whom the promise had been made, and that one is Christ. So uh, there, uh, many people remember that uh, Moses introduced the Old Testament law, and he was the lawgiver. Uh, mm -hmm. People forget that that wasn't the founding of our religion. The founding of our religion w was with Abraham 400 and something years earlier. And Abraham had operated under a whole different economy of salvation, one in which his priesthood was built around Melchizedek. And people don't remember Melchizedek had, did not offer the blood of sheep and bulls and all the rest of it. He offered bread and wine. That he's a lot of people don't even think about it, but Catholics hear about him every time they go to mass. Right, exactly right. right. So mo the period of probation that was introduced after the golden calf, and all this is is spelled by, out much more by Moses. convincingly in the book. That period of probation had uh, a time limit on it. Okay, we got to take a in break. Words, John. It, we got we got to take a break. Okay. Yeah, well right. said, you. I, I, I wish I was you. I wish I knew all this stuff. We're talking with we're talking with Rod. No, you, no, you don't. We're talking with you, Rod Bennett. I'm lying. <laughs> yeah, we're talking with Rod Bennett. We're going to come back and talk about why he's called the Wonder Boss. We'll be more. We'll, we'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. People love our EWTN TV show, Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak. Thanks to you, the show has won four different Tally Awards. And now, instead of waiting each week for the next episode to air. You can actually binge watch our show and even share it with your friends when you go to deepadventure.com and join the Mama Bears or the Man Cave. Along with all the other benefits, you get total access to all the seasons of our aired episodes, plus instant access to episodes that won't even air for several months. Long Ride Home with Bear Wastick, a great way to communicate the gospel in a gritty enough way that even tough men will stop and watch. 
at deepadventure.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to NotreDameFCU.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. When you go to the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube channel, you get access to all of our free playlists, including hundreds of episodes of the Bear Wozniak adventure, plus the three-year journey through the whole catechism in our Ocean Sunrise Catechism series. And you even get short clips and live streaming of Baron Cindy's Adventures in Paradise videos. Go to YouTube and subscribe to the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure channel. Are you still listening? I thought we warned you to change to an easy listening station. Well, you asked for it. Here is more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Our new season of Long Ride Home, our motorcycle TV series on EWTN is out right now. You can watch it there. It'll probably be out in Prime Video too, or you can go to our deepadventure.com website and become a member of the Man Cave or the Mama Bears and you get access to all 33 episodes. The new season, all 11 episodes are filmed here in Hawaii. So, I, you know, I used to be called the Wonder Woz and you, call, you were called the Wonder Boss <laughs> back in the day, I, right? I published a magazine <laughs> called Wonder. So oh. I was the boss. So oh, that's, that's so cool. Got to so be, the, uh, the word wonder just seems like such a great title. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But let's let's that, go that's right the origin. So let's go right into this. Um Justin Martyr in the Old Testament. Tell us tell us about that. When the when we were we were discerning what would go ahead. Well the reaction to Ju the Judaizers was uh created by a man named uh, Marcion, whom I personally believe, and I make this case in the book. Marcion started out as a Judaizer, and uh, he eventually had such a uh, reaction in the other direction that he wanted to reject the Old Testament altogether. So he was a Christian who believed you had to fulfill right. the law, and they right, said, right, yeah, right. he threw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, he, uh, uh, he <laughs> believed that the—eventually uh, came to the strange point of believing that the God of the Old Testament was real, but he wasn't the real God. Right. That he was a kind of a second uh, level uh, spiritual being under God. He was the creator of the of the earth, and he was the God of the Jewish people, the Hebrew people. But he wasn't the supreme God. There was and, a and this became a this is a big him. this is a big deal. Oh the yeah, whole, it all was of Christianity a, could have become Marcion. There's it, God. It, it could very well have, and there there have been revivals of this. Uh, through the centuries, attempts. Anytime you've got somebody who talks to you about the God of love, who is better than the Old Testament God of judgment, he's, a, he's, a he's basically pitching a version of Mar Marcionism. Yeah, there's no new so, heresies. Uh, they're all, they're all, they all go back. So, so tell it, us. Was, uh, it was Justin who was the one who wrote the church's first great book about all of these Old Testament problems, the problems that kept people from being comfortable Christians. What, what, what book, what, 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 what of his writings his was book that? Was called, this book is called The Dialogue with Trifo the Jew. Oh, yeah. That's Trifo a was a yeah. rabbi uh, whom, who Justin debated about the year 155 or so. And a lot of those old philosophical books were written like dialogues, weren't they? So he well, definitely... What, this, this really does seem to be have been a debate that really happened, although the way he writes it up is in, a, in such a form that right. it includes both the argument against the Judaizers and the argument against so the Marcionites. So it's, so it's, so very, it's really they're the same heresy in different forms. But it's the Aquinas way of showing presenting both arguments. Right, right. In, in their best so light, yeah. He, Justin presents the answer, the church's answer to both errors, the, both the Old Testament maximizers and the Old Testament minimizers are both in the wrong and dangerously in the wrong because they both falsify the gospel in their own way and they both tend to make the Old Testament into something that it isn't. Justin knew 
that the tradition passed on from Christ and the apostles was that the Old Testament writing is scripture and that the God in it is the God worshiped by Christ and the apostles. So uh, the, uh, uh, the danger to the Old Testament was a danger to Christianity root and branch, and it had to be dealt with. And Justin is there to answer the questions. The really great thing about it is that Justin was uh, somebody who grew up in Samaria, although he was a Roman, he was a pagan Roman. He was a kind of a, a, a colonizer. And, but the interesting thing is he was converted by reading the Old Testament prophets, not the, the New Testament apostles or gospels. The, he was converted by the, the, the prophets, so he understood the, Jude, the appeal of Judaism. He understood the uh, beauty of the Old Testament writings. And at the same time, he had the other side of it, too. He was a man who was not a Jew. He was somebody who, who needed to know what the gospel plan for saving non-Jews was. So this was a personal, personal uh, uh, problem to work through for Justin, and he does do it. And in doing it, he gave the answer that satisfied the whole church and allowed us to speak of an Old Testament and a New Testament as part of one Bible. And it was Justin that solved those problems and uh, really destroyed both the Judaistic heresy and the Marcionite heresy. Uh, in the early, in the mid 150s AD, with that, and, with and that what, one book. And what's the essence the of that? What's the, what's the essence of one or two of his, his main points? Well, uh, <clears throat> again, it's a little bit, a little bit too complicated to do in ten minutes. But it is. Uh, well, you the, only have five. Oh, oh well, then I really am in trouble. <laughs> I will say this: that uh, I think it was one of the medieval uh, exegetes who who really worked out what it means for something to be fulfilled. When an apple falls down into the ground and shrivels up and the seed goes into the ground and it dies, it gradually becomes, if it all goes well, a small tree, a big tree, a tree full of big fruit. But it, it can only do so by ceasing to be a seed, ceasing to be an apple, really. And uh, so when a thing is fulfilled, it has fulfilled its purpose. It has done the thing that it was destined to do, the thing that it was created for. It fulfilled itself by ceasing to be and by becoming something else. So uh, when Jesus said, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, to bring it to completion. That is the best example I've ever heard of this. This is yes, great. Yes, the law is gone. It's not for Christians. It never was for the Jews permanently. It was always meant to shrivel up and die and then be reborn into something else. But that was not the death of it or the end of it. It was the fulfillment of it. It was always destined to become an apple tree. And that is the sense in which Christ, according to Justin and according to this whole school of thought, brought the Old Testament law to its completion and thus to its fulfillment. It fulfilled its purpose. Wow, that's so well said. I, I've never heard it said quite. Do you know who that was? Was that, is that it was Robert Grosstest, an English, uh, an oh, English uh, medieval uh, exegete. Uh, although he probably spoke French, <laughs> he, he was English. He was he up in that. Spoke. He was in that corner of France, right, or that corner of England, Norman. Yeah, depending on how you yeah, look at yeah. it, <laughs> depending on whose perspective you're looking at. Right, right. Well, it's a beautiful book, Scripture, Scripture, Scripture Wars with Justin Martyr. What's one or two more things people can take? take uh, from you today that uh, that they'll find in the book when they get it? Well, you'll see, I think, how uh, how different versions of the scriptures were created to satisfy different audiences. It's kind of like cable news channels these days. We get cable news channels based on how the viewers want the story told. You know, everybody likes to hear it the way the way they like. And uh, there were oh, there were Bible canons. Bible uh, manuscripts that were created in in the early centuries, the first two centuries, that were cut for different audiences. If you wanted to be a law maximizer, you wanted to be a Judaizing Christian or else just a Jew in the new centuries, then you uh, rejected the Septuagint version of the scriptures, which was used which, by which the is, apostles. Which Jesus quoted. Absolutely. There are 350-something Old, okay. Old 
Testament quotations in the gospel in the okay, New let, Testament. Let me ask you this then, because we more got more than three hundred are direct quotes from the Septuagint. From the Septuagint, right? That's right, why it's the exactly. Old Testament. That's the Old Testament that Catholics use. So, exactly right. So, so let me. Uh, yeah, it has the other, the extra, the other books. But uh, two or two minutes. Tell me about then how the this library of letters and books came to be canonized. You got two minutes. <laughs> Okay, I can't do that, but I will say that uh, uh, I will say that the tradition seems to have been a tradition of the apostles, but it had gotten a little fuzzy around the edges. So the churches had a project of looking at all of their traditions about which books and letters belonged in the Bible and comparing notes with each other about which traditions were the most authentic, which traditions were the oldest, and then by comparing that process, which, by the way, took about 300 years. And this was a bunch the, of bishops, wasn't it? And uh, everybody else, too. The, mm. the, uh, we, they went literally went from church to church and asked people, which canon do you use here? And who, and who was the they, though? The, the, they were the people who were investigating it. Okay. We don't know who the bishops and priests and elders and all That's the rest so of it cool. uh, sent out, but they seem to have sent out real investigators to compare Bible canons because the whole thing was based on Go find the churches that were founded by the apostles. Find out which books they read from the pulpit. Wow. That is your canon list. No, no, no. And it then fell, when you it brought fell. them together, there was a little bit of things that didn't quite overlap, and there was a little process of discernment there. But for the most part, they found the traditional Christian canon. And when was this? Even though all the details down took a while. You said it took a, it took a long time. When was the canon established? Well, about uh, it's hard to say. St. Augustine overs uh, oversaw a, uh, a process in the mid-300s, or late 300s, 360s, he, a final uh, going over. And he was, the one, that, he was the one that really argued for it. we got to go, but wasn't he the one that really argued for the Book of Revelation to be included? Well, the Book of Revelation was doubted in the East and accepted in the West. Uh, the book of Hebrews was accepted in the West and doubted in the East. So that gives you an example of uh, some of the little uh, uh, disparities. And, and so this com things that had to be reconciled. And this comes back to the big question of who has this authority. I know Southern Baptists say, well, Luther said well, every person could read the Bible for themselves and understand it. They don't need a teaching authority. But Jesus said, well, I will poor Luther, that was easy for him to believe in his day because. Uh, he finally read the Bible in German, and he thought everybody would get the same answer he did. That was more believable in a world where reading was far less common, especially reading in your own language. Yeah, but right away he he, he, he shared the same thing that both most of us have, and that is, I see it this way. Surely everybody will see. I, it you know, it's way. interesting, as you know, and he had that his good buddy Zwingli. He and him had almost immediately had a falling out about scripture. <clears throat> we don't need to be our own pope. We need to have a teaching authority. Highly recommend that you. Uh, Jesus said, "I will build a church." And we don't know. He, he was a builder. He was a builder. He had a blueprint. He had a plan. And uh, you can help understand more about this process by reading Scripture Words with Rod Bennett, the Wonder Boss. <laughs> Thank you, Rod, for joining us. We got to go. We're already Thanks, buddy. over. It's been fun. I, yeah, I, I, I want to have that. I want to have a, a cigar with you or whatever. That sounds great. Well, you come down here and have some of this Tennessee whiskey. You yeah, we'll do it. My grandfather used to make it out behind the barn out there. Yeah, yeah you probably ago. still are. You're just not telling people. <laughs> We're talking with Rod well, it's Bennett. Legal. It's legal here now. So. <laughs> the last time I was in Tennessee, I think I was actually in Kentucky, one of the distilleries there that I visited, the next day all those barrels came crashing down. I don't know if you remember that a few years ago. It wasn't yeah. my fault. It wasn't my fault. Well. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we got to go. We got to go. Rod, thanks for joining us. Till next week, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha, so long, everybody. Aloha. Thanks for listening to the Bear Wilding Adventure. Find more manly conversation at the Bear Wilding Deep Adventure YouTube channel. Subscribe and ring the bell.